I'm Dr. Daniel Halleck, and welcome to The Wild Conversation, where we make the best thinking in psychology, leadership, and organizational science accessible to leaders who are willing to learn and edit for their sake and for the sake of others. In graduate school, there is a student that I looked up to. His name was Peter. I believe most of us have a Peter in our life. Peter was the man. He was smart, articulate, well-liked. I knew that Peter was going places and that he would do amazing things for the people in his life. One day I bumped into Peter in the library. It was his final quarter in our program and he was about to launch into the job market. Peter, you graduated in a couple months. You made it. You must be so excited. His response surprised me. Yeah, but I haven't really built my network like I should have. So I don't have any jobs lined up yet. His answer terrified me. If someone as impressive as Peter did not have a job lined up, then I had no chance. As the son of two immigrants, education was the key to success. That was imprinted into me. I could not afford to waste this opportunity. I left that conversation feeling anxious and fearful. I needed to find a way to protect my career. The stakes were too high for me to finish school without a job prospect. Then I remembered the advice I'd been given countless times. Go network, build relationships. After all, it's all, all about who you know, not what you know. They were right. Education wasn't the highway of opportunity. It was just an on-ramp. The highway of opportunity is social capital, your network, the people you know, and more importantly, the people who know you. I was determined. I set off to build a network that would guarantee my success. I spent as much time as I could building relationships with people who could hire me when I graduated. The process worked, but it didn't feel right. I was meeting the right people. I was having meaningful conversations. I was learning about the job market. Internship and job opportunities started to open up. But networking and building relationships began to feel gross. I was approaching people as a transactional consumer, not a relational investor. My driving questions focused on what can I get from this person? How can they help me? I was asking the wrong questions. Networking was a necessary evil. It felt gross. Then one day the tables were turned. I bumped into a childhood acquaintance at a coffee shop. We struck up a conversation. He then spent the entire time trying to convince me to join the multi-level marketing scheme that he was a part of. You see, the more people he signed up underneath him, the more money he would make. But that's not all. He would help me build an empire as well. In fact, he told me that I could make so much money, I would never need to work again. I could provide for my parents as they aged. I could give back to them for all that they had given to me all by helping people simply change their spending habits and buy products from us. It felt like he was looking at me with cartoon dollar signs in his eyes, only focused on what he could get. How could he use me, leverage my relationships to build his little kingdom? I felt like I needed to take a bath afterwards. In that moment, I began to realize if networking and building relationships ever feels gross, then you must be doing it wrong. There has to be a better way than being a transactional consumer in relationships. What can I get from you wasn't enough. Turns out that social scientists have studied what I experienced. In 2014, researchers from the University of Toronto, Harvard, and Northeastern teamed together to investigate the impact of building social networks and professional relationships on people's sense of morality. They conducted four studies and they looked at the differing impact of building relationships for friendship versus building relationships for the sake of furthering personal business goals. What they found across their work was that building instrumental relationships driven for professional or organizational outcomes negatively impacted the psychological state 
of moral purity in their participants. In other words, building relationships primarily for personal gain left people feeling dirty and even morally stained. In fact, these people, when they felt dirty after networking, they're even more likely to buy soap and shampoo. They just wanted to take a hot shower. Decades of research confirms the common advice about networking. If you build social capital, it positively impacts all sorts of outcomes, job performance, salary levels, employability, and a whole lot more. If you want to build your career or your business, then networking is a good strategy. But here was the dilemma. When people felt dirty after networking, they made less effort towards those relationships, even though they were critical for their work and careers. This is what those researchers said. We found that professionals who feel dirtier from instrumental networking tend to engage in it less and in turn have lower job performance. Feeling dirty about building relationships for most people is likely to dampen their desire and their future efforts to build purposeful relationships, even though those relationships positively impact their performance. There's a reason I felt gross when I approached people as a transactional consumer instead of as a relational investor. How can you do relationships in a way that you don't feel like you need to rinse off after every coffee meeting? I started to ask a different question. Instead of what can I get from this person, I began to ask, what can I give to this person? Everything changed. I began searching for a new way. I discovered generous relational investors who introduced me to a different paradigm. Jeff, a business leader in Seattle, was one of them. If you meet him for coffee, you quickly realize his goal is to learn how he can serve you, not how you can serve him. This new mindset moved from being a greedy transactional consumer to a generous relational investor. Relational investors leave people better than they found them. The focus wasn't on giving to gain or even about paying it forward so that positive things circle back around to you one day. Relational investors are focused on giving out of the overflow of who they are and what they'd already been given. Relational investors bring generosity beyond reciprocity. They ask a different question. Instead of starting with, what can I get? They ask, what can I give? It represents a mindset shift from focusing on pathology to looking for potential. The human default is to focus on pathology. Pathology is all about the things that are, that are going wrong, the barriers, the obstacles, the brokenness. For decades, psychology and many other human-centered disciplines have focused on pathology. What's broken? How can we fix it? Over the last 20 to 30 years, there's been a revolution that's pushed against pathology to turn towards potential. What's going well? What is working? How do we make things even better? It's a shift from scarcity to abundance, an assumption that there is opportunity and potential to be realized. Both are necessary. We have to understand barriers and limitations, but also see possibility and potential. But our baseline is self-preservation. Make sure I secure a job, protect my career, position myself for success. When I moved beyond the fear of finding a job, I became free to shift from protecting my pathology to looking for potential. As the old saying goes, it's better to give than it is to receive. And you don't have to be a wealthy executive to become a relational investor. I was a poor graduate student. I discovered that relational investors generously give their time, treasure, and talent. And generosity looks different in different seasons. It could be as simple as the undivided gift of your attention, or a heartfelt thank you note, or an offer to help a coworker with a project. It could be a valuable introduction to another person, or the offer to review someone's resume for them. The possibilities for generosity are only limited by your imagination. Becoming a relational investor is a choice. It's a lifestyle. 
it's a new way of being that reflects a new way of thinking. People aren't a process. People are the purpose. Business is all about people. The goal isn't to leverage relationships, extract value from people. It's about building meaningful, generous, mutually beneficial relationships and focusing on how you can serve people, how you can give to them. Even if you don't get anything back right away or even at all, every person has inherent dignity, value, and worth. So relationships have value regardless of the outcome. Years after my conversation with Peter in the library, I found myself working in a university, helping run a graduate business program. I was meeting a prospective student to learn about his goals for the future and his hopes for graduate school. He was a great candidate. and I really wanted him in my program. But over the course of the conversation, I realized that what I had to offer wasn't the best fit for him. Reluctantly, I pointed him in a different direction. A year later, I had another similar conversation with a young woman who was exploring our program. She was awesome. Her goals aligned with our training, and she ended up becoming one of our best students. It wasn't until after she started, though, that I discovered that she found out about the program from the young man I'd met a year before. He told her that if she met with me, I'd put her interests first, and that if she wasn't the right fit, I'd point her in the right direction. Focusing on the interests of other people can pay off over the long term. But that's not the point. There is nothing more rewarding than giving to other people. My parents, they impressed the value of education on me, but they also demonstrated the value of generosity. They've been avid suburban gardeners for over 40 years. Every year, they carefully till their soil, fertilize it, prepare seeds, water, water some more. And as time goes on, different plants will blossom and produce fruit at different times. They tend their gardens so well that every year they harvest so much produce that there's no way they can possibly eat it all. They have so much that it will spoil. It will go to waste. So what do they do? Instead of going to spoil, they spoil their friends. They take all the excess, they put it in bags and baskets, and they generously share it with all their friends and neighbors. Often, they even use their extra seeds to help friends start their own garden. As I look back, I realize my parents, they did not garden just for themselves. They certainly enjoyed the fresh fruit and vegetables, but they had equal, if not greater joy, in giving to people around them. The relationships in their lives represented a place for giving, not a vehicle for taking. My parents demonstrated that you can get more than you give by giving more than you get. Our relationships, our networks are also like a garden. If we tend our network well, it will grow and it will produce fruit. So much, in fact, that there's no way we can consume it all for ourselves. Instead of letting a relationship go to spoil or go unused, we can share those relationships with someone else who needs what that person has to offer. When we give relational capital, we don't lose it. It doesn't decrease. It increases. We can even help someone start their own garden. Becoming a generous relational investor starts with a new mindset, a different paradigm of relationships. So what's your relational posture? Are you a greedy transactional consumer or a generous relational investor? Are you protecting your pathology or pushing for potential? It's never too late to start asking a different question and start looking for what can I give instead of what can I get? <laughs>